Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios, it's time for Women in Motion. Brought to you by WBEC West. Join forces, succeed together. Now, here's your host. Lee Cantor here with Dr. Pamela Williamson. Another episode of Women in Motion. So excited about the group we have here today, Pamela. Me too. I am excited for two reasons. One, this is our second show where we are celebrating Juneteenth. And the second reason that I'm excited is because we have two amazing guests. Our first one I'd like to introduce is Anna Spearman. She is the CEO and founder of Techie Staffing. Since launching this amazing business, she has placed VPs of engineering, senior directors of UX, principal data scientists, directors of product management, directors of engineering. Techie Staffing was profitable within the first year of operation, and they will be celebrating their third anniversary on July 6th of this year. So Anna, welcome. Our second guest that we have today is Todd Jackson, also known as TJ. He's the manager of supplier diversity at Republic Services. He's responsible for creating and managing supplier diversity in the environmental service industry space. So TJ, I'd like to throw the first question out to you, which is just tell us a little bit more about your role within Republic Service and talk to us a little bit about who Republic Service is. Sure. Thank you, Pamela. Yes, this is TJ. Supplier diversity here at Republic Services really started back in the emphasis of the George Floyd uh, movement incident. And Republic Services wanted to to change the narrative of diversifying the, the supply chain. And so my my job was to create and design a program that will allow diverse suppliers, certified diverse suppliers to participate in the supply chain in the environmental industry. So our purpose is really to transform supplier diversity within the environmental services industry and then just really drive that economic empowerment with diverse communities. And through that is the inclusive uh, supply chain. So our procurement procedures, we're changing those. We're making sure we're doing different things. And I would always like to to say that I'm probably more of a, a dad C, and which that means D is the di- disruptor, A is the advocate, and D is the doer. And then I'm a supporter. And then, of course, the C is the connector. So I'm all those things uh, here at uh, Republic Services. Now, the topic of today's show is to celebrate Black women entrepreneurs. Is there anything Black women entrepreneurs can get some help with when it comes to some of the barriers that it is uh, to get into some of these corporations to do work with them? I'd like to throw that out to to both TJ and Anna, maybe explain some of the barriers and also explain some of the ways to get into the corporations to partner. Hi, so this is Anna. So I would say, you know, as of course, I'm a black woman entrepreneur and for the past three years, and I would say maybe one of the biggest barriers is just networking, you know, but I really realized with um, DEI and specifically diverse suppliers and diversity in general, it's really about breaking that network because a lot of people who only network within their own circle, usually it's only going to be a lot of homogenous groups and it's not going to be truly diverse. So um, it's really interesting when you, when I first got in and when I was creating techie staffing, I had no network, no contacts, like you know, I had to create all of that from scratch. And it's interesting how you see how a lot of people have the privilege to have different contacts in their families and friends that have the opportunity to make decisions and really give them an opportunity because that's all it takes is an opportunity. TJ, can you share your, your kind of, because you're on the other side, you have some of these opportunities that the entrepreneur would want. 
Yes, and and and, and I would say an echo, uh, Anna's uh, is really about the the network and getting to know um, that supplier diversity professional if they have one in there that particular uh, company, or someone who has that connection, such as an area president, such as a, g- a general manager, to connect with that uh, that supplier. But really, growing the the network is what it's about. Uh, and I would say that just because you have that connection doesn't mean that that business is going to happen. I think the emphasis should be more on if you don't have the network, grow the network, make sure that you have a relationship with that person. And then when opportunities come, um, they can have that opportunity to provide uh, you as a, uh, a supplier within that uh, response for a proposal or just doing business. Now, is there any advice on how to grow a network when you don't have a network? Like Anna was mentioning, there's, uh, you know, some people have relatives or friends that are part of that crowd you want to get involved with. But if you don't have anybody, how do you kind of penetrate that network so you can get that opportunity? That this is TJ. That's a good question, Lee. And I think one of the ways is that uh, the organizations such as Webeck West is providing those opportunities to net with network with uh, corporations um, through conferences, through some of the uh, venues that um, the uh, organization is uh, providing. I would say show up, be available, and uh, continue to to uh, network and um, harvest those relationships. And this is Anna. And just like what TJ is saying um, last month, actually, or actually it was the month of March, I attended the WeBank National Conference in Nashville, Tennessee. And being in person instead of, because I initially was just doing cold outreach on LinkedIn, but being in person and having people see me and be able to introduce myself and really tell my story in person really made a difference It was amazing to not only network with the WBEs, but networking with corporate members who were, there was the expo where I was able to connect with many supplier uh, diversity professionals from Fortune 500 companies and healthcare, automotive, just a diverse set of industries. So that really allowed me to just open my network. And I was even able to run into people that I had attended previous in-person events with at the WeBank uh, West. And it was amazing that they were able to see that I was there and I was actively investing in my business and coming out and just really showing that I really want to be an active member. And it really made a difference, you know, to have um, increased introductions and more people really wanting to create additional connections for me. Yeah, I totally agree, uh, Lee, on that. This is TJ. And it's just really about that uh, in person. I, I mean, as you know, we've been going through the virtual world for since the pandemic, but we're out of that pandemic. So those, those at eye to eye contact uh, relating to uh, the stories that uh, folks are, are telling is very important. And um, as uh, Anna spoke about is, you know, there's going to be a lower probability of you connecting through those cold um, emails uh, such as LinkedIn or just getting on uh, a corporation's website and putting in something. You really need to have that interaction and uh, the organization such as WeBank West and um, the, the National WeBank can provide that. Pamela? I I think the only thing I would add is that showing up is definitely uh, significantly important. I I think the other thing that I hear a lot from corporations is that people will show up, they will connect and get that eye-to-eye experience, but then sometimes people forget to follow up. And I think that's the other big piece of having a successful networking experience is to make sure that you follow up with who you connect with. I think my other comment would just be around making sure that you have a strategy for your networking. I think a lot of people just go out and connect, but don't really have a strategy with what they're going to do with that connection once they make it. So I think the follow-up and, you know, showing up, following up, 
and having a strategy are the three pieces that I think are, are significant. Now, do you think that if you do an effective job in networking in this manner and really take advantage of the associations like Webeck West, um, where you can be seen, you can be heard, is that going to help us resolve this lack of representation a lot of women of color feel? This is Pamela. I'm going to say uh, no. I, I think that that's a piece that is a woman of color, that's a piece I can own. Like I can definitely attend networking events. I definitely am going to show up. I'm going to hold conversations. I'm going to follow up. But I think corporations hold a big piece of moving that forward, especially if people want to do businesses with corporate America. I think that, um, Todd, I'm curious what your thoughts are around what corporations can do or what your corporation is doing to not only just ensure that women of color have a seat at the table, but also ensuring that they're able to order and they're able to actually eat from that table of opportunity. Yeah, that was uh, I was thinking about that as you were you were speaking uh, I, I noticed that uh, um, here at Republic Services, there were really some couple of uh, um, internal goals that were were, were set, and it, and it was really based on doing business with um, not only Black-owned businesses, but women of color as well. Um, and so I think some of the corporations, through that pandemic's um, um, and all the uh, the killings that uh, people were really trying to commit uh, to doing business with uh, women of color uh, and black owned businesses. Um, but I think sometimes the corporations uh, may forget where, uh, how to uh, proceed in that after all the uh, the limelight have settled. So I think it's really be, uh is really on uh, the corporations to main that uh, particular uh, focus on um, making sure that when they provide uh, those opportunities, get them to the table. And you can look at your supply chain and know how many suppliers you have. You know the ethnicity around those suppliers. I think your focus has to be intentional. Um, and that is for any corporation if they're doing uh, true business around supplier diversity. It is not a box for me. It is the way of life for me here at Republic Services. And um, and you have to have mechanisms in place for corporations um, to make sure that those uh, those initiatives are, are valid and make sure those initiatives are, are done and and, and um, materialize. So putting metrics around that is one of that uh, one of the things. Also, trying to have compensation around uh, the businesses that you 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 bring it in or doing business with here at Republic Services. We're a little different uh, model. We're somewhat uh, of a hybrid. So we have operations uh, in approximately 40 something states. And so we headquarter here in Phoenix. Um, but it is um, it behooves all of us in uh, Republic Services to to understand that it's not only uh, sustainability as a pillar. It's not only charitable giving as a pillar, but it is. Uh, also diversified in the supply chain, because uh, if we're doing business in a diverse community, we need to have a diverse supply chain and we need to make sure that uh, all of our necessity are represented in our supply chain. Now, Anna, your business is just three years old. Um, have you seen any progress? This is Anna. And of course, I've seen pop progress, you know, and I started during the pandemic and, and had to make that pivot. It definitely was. It was a little daunting at first, I'll admit. I always say that it was super stressful, but at the same time, it's super rewarding. So actually, in 2021, that's when it really blew up because um, at the time I had contacted a CEO who raised 50 million round a series B round of funding, and they were going through a hiring sprint. And it was an amazing first like a client to really have because uh, basically it was just a really mission-based pharma tech company. And so it felt amazing to be able to pitch that startup to engineers and really emphasize 
how they can potentially help people's lives in terms of getting the proper drug tr- uh, pricing transparency that they need. And so in one month, we actually filled five roles. It was senior front end, senior back end, and senior full stack engineer roles. And since then, you know, we've been working with companies like Indeed, as well as multiple high growth startups to fill their engineering leadership, um, as well as their product and design roles. So it's definitely just taking a lot of contacting and creating everything from scratch from my networking, as well as establishing the business paperwork and coding the website. But, but for sure, I've seen like um, crazy progress and it's amazing to see how I started and where I am right now. It's just truly a transformation for myself and techie staffing. Pamela. So I have a follow-up question uh, from TJ's statement that he made. I'm curious about, you talked about the diversification of the supply chain. I'm curious about whether you see a correlation between the diversification of the supply chain and the diversification of those individuals within organizations that make decisions? Uh, Yeah, good question. Yeah, so if you see, if you hear at Republic Services, I think uh, you probably hit the um, uh, uh, the head on the the nail there. It's basically if you have those particular uh, diversifications within that particular area, I think you get more, more diversity. I mean, that you can really go on a correlation here with Republic services as far as supplier to area. So we're, we're definitely in all the 43 states, right? So if you have some diversification within in a particular area, I think it drives more diverse, uh, unlike uh, unless you have a super champion that is a non-diverse uh, area. So uh, I think you can draw the, that correlation uh, for sure, Pamela, um, but it's not all always true. But I think the the thing that I uh, harp on here at Republic Services is that um, we continue to be those change agents, uh, whether you in a uh, undiverse area or, or, or not, right? So here at Republic Services, probably in the Wyoming, in the Montana, in the, all that areas, we probably won't have a lot of diverse uh, as far as women of color. However, we do have a lot of diverse uh, for veterans as well. So that could be, uh, that's kind of how you kind of correlate it to areas of the United States as well. Um, I think you probably can draw other correlations to the geographical area within the United States as well. But uh, yes, there are many correlations um, throughout uh, our corporations and and probably other corporations as well on where they see that. So I really think, yes, you really need to have some diversification within your workforce um, to drive uh, supply chain diversification as well. So I'd like to shift gears a little bit here. Um, can we talk about how you've individually overcome some adversity? Um, Anna, from your standpoint as a startup, um, you know, that has its own challenges. And then TJ, in your role, there must have been a lot of, um, you know, hurdles you had to get over in order to kind of see the, your vision through. Well, this is Anna. I would say, well, just to start off with my background. So three years ago, actually, at the time I was attending the University of Virginia, where I was a computer science major and an entrepreneurship minor. And I was coming back to LA where I was born and raised for spring break. And that's when lockdown happened in spring of 2020. So I had to finish my second semester of senior year remote. And upon graduation, there was initially, I either wanted to be a junior software engineer and then be a technical product manager and then become an entrepreneur. That was always going to be my goal was to be an entrepreneur no matter what, because I, I was raised around entrepreneurship. But so um, but just basically there was in a rapid dwindling of entry level tech and product roles uh, with companies during the time. They just didn't really know how to ramp up entry level tech talent or really what was going on in general. Uh, But on these same job boards, I saw a wealth of senior tech jobs, specifically with companies that were thriving due to the pandemic, such as Discord and Peloton. 
So I, um, with a little bit of experience recruiting at a past summer internship, as well as wanting to utilize my entrepreneurship minor, I just thought, why not start now? And I created Techie Staffing. So Techie Staffing is actually a technology staffing agency specializing in direct hire engineering product and design role um, nationwide. So the biggest adversity is, of course, you know, starting off like, I, I am young or it's almost like a triple minority because I have, you know, I'm definitely, I'm a black woman, but there's also the age. So just overcoming, I always have to be twice as good. You know, I have to make sure that I am extremely sharp because if I make a mistake, then people will be like, oh, well, she's young. Like, okay, there you like, and just disregard when really there's a lot of people who have many years of experience that making plenty of mistakes, you know, but because they have that years of experience to protect them, that definitely helps. So it's just always trying to stay as sharp as possible and really honing in on my craft so that people truly understand that, you know, we will be able to provide like top tier caliber talent. And we worked with Fortune 500 companies where we've beaten out agencies that have been around for, for 30 plus years. So it's just always staying as sharp as possible and, you know, doing what I can personally do to break down barriers, you know, that that's in my control. Because Some things I do understand aren't in my control, but, you know, the some of the subjects or things that I do have to learn that are, are in my control, then I am going to execute on it. Yeah, this this is TJ. I, I think um, if you if I go back uh, uh, a few years uh, prior to Republic Services, I did work with Intel. Intel was one of the members of the BDR who were looking at to do more business with not only black owned business but women of business as well uh, within the, uh, the 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 BDR. Um, when the the incident about 2020, 2021, I, that's when I kind of opened up my LinkedIn to to see if I can do more of an impact to those co- uh, corporations that do not even have a supplier diversity uh, uh, program. So from, from that standpoint, uh, just coming in and creating a, a new environment around diverse suppliers was a, a barrier of itself, right? Because it's more of, when I say you're a supplier diversity professional, you really are a change agent uh, uh, for the corporation as well. And you have to put in some of those particular practices of, of, of um, uh, you know, where you have um, MSAs with different content and how do you go about uh, uh, creating um, certain policies around uh, supplier diversity. Um, so you, you always have that kickback of, you know, why we got to do this or uh, barriers such as that or, or, or why we got to change. Um, why, uh, why this and why that? My, my answer to that is, is that the world is changing as well. And uh, when you have a diverse supplier, I would say probably over 90 percent of that diverse supplier has that innovation, that technology that some of the larger um, corporations or suppliers don't have because they don't have to be agile. They don't have to be flexible. They don't have to be uh, adaptive. They've already got their foot into the door. And so we have to make sure that those barriers for those diverse suppliers or, or, or removed, or at least have an opportunity to to do that. So what I do is I really try to make sure that uh, it is um, the barriers that are pop up that we we resolve them, whether it be through supplier segmentation, whether it be through tier one. Not everybody can be a tier one supplier within the the Republic Services. Some may have to work with a non-diverse supplier that uh, has the niche of the market in the environmental industry and, and put that into a tier two spin. But either either way, tier one or tier two, we definitely want to make sure that uh, the supply chain from end to end is diverse. And so those barriers such as networking or getting them in front of some of the uh, category managers or senior manager leaderships, that that is that is important. And of course, dispelling dispelling those myths around um, diversity as far as um, 
uh, diverse supplier. It needs to be uh, nipped in the bud. So, TJ, what are some of those myths? I think some of the myths are they're, they're too small. Right. Uh, Everybody started out at some point (laughs) small. Uh, They just grew the business. The second of all is they don't have um, uh, innovation and technology. We know that that's not true because they're more agile and flexible than the the bigger boats. I mean, you can take, for instance, uh, the ship of Intel. Intel needs very small tugboats to put it in the port. Same as the environmental industry, where environmental industry was more uh, waste connection, waste connected. Um, so how do you go about dispelling that, you know, this is just a, um, a male uh, dominant, uh, which it is a dominant uh, field? How do you go about saying that women can play p- a part of that as well? And so you have uh, women-owned disposal companies. You have women-owned um, uh, gas uh, pr- uh, providers, petroleum. Uh, they can do that. So um, the question it is, it's not about not about if they not can do it, but how about giving them opportunity to do it and execute? And that's what it's that's what it's about. Well, uh, stories kind of. Uh are a great way to illustrate some of these points. Uh, TJ, can you share a story about a minority supplier that really, um, with with an opportunity, really got to a new level? You don't have to name the name, but maybe explain the challenge that they were asked to, to deliver on and, and how they delivered. Well, I think one of the things is, is that um, uh, one of the suppliers uh, – we are using in one type of capability. Um, so uh, when we looked at that particular uh, supplier, we noticed that uh, the supplier had m- many channels of um, opportunities for this particular uh, for Republic Services. And the question is, how do we expand the growth? How do we expand their capability within the organization uh, from one product to to the next that w- that we can use? Well, we just uh, ensure that. Um, you know, it met the criteria around that and then uh, provided uh, an opportunity for that to 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 happen into one of the um, one of the areas that uh, geographical areas, because each each landfill is different. Each state has different regulations around how we align, align the uh, sales for uh, making the landfill. Um, so <clears throat> that provides different uh, geosynthetics around liners and things of that nature. So uh, giving them an opportunity to expand within the organization uh, from one product or one service to multiple services. So using that particular supplier to grow their business through multiple service and capability. That is just one of the ways. And then the other way is bringing on that supplier that um, in a small way, uh, providing, you know, uh, everybody needs an opportunity, but providing the service that they do um, uh, got more um, more notoriety around the the stakeholders, and once the stakeholders did that, uh, the word spread. And then after the word spread, the the per the supplier got more opportunities within uh, a sector, and started growing the business by that. So there's just two stories um, that I shared uh, that shows you how you can can grow within the Republic Services. Now, Anna, can you share a story that for your firm where you were given an opportunity and maybe share, you don't have to name the company, but the problem they were having and how you were able to help them and that helped you get to a new level? Of course. So this is Anna. So at the time I was working with a Fortune 500 company and they were hiring for a VP of engineering. And this company, their future was really going to be embedded in in AI and really trying to just transform their industry and, and really make a difference. So uh, they were, this VP of engineering was going to manage an org of 300 engineers and hire an additional, I think it was about 250 engineers. So this was a big role. And both the internal and other agencies, it was other executive recruitment agencies that were really large and had been around for years, 
they just really weren't sending any talent that was even passing through the initial stages of the interview. Uh, so they decided to give techie staffing a chance and not, that's all it takes is a chance. So I took that chance and I wasn't going to lose it. So we recruited for the role. And by the end of that project, we finished with uh, two VP of engineering candidates that the company liked so much that they were willing to present both of them an offer. So if one candidate rejected the offer, it would be presented to the other candidate. And it was just an amazing candidate matchmaking experience. Like it really warmed my heart because the candidate that ended up accepting the offer, he was really looking for it. The role just wasn't about the salary. It was overall about the company he was working at and the culture. And especially due to the pandemic and it, it really changed his outlook and, and his mindset. So that company coming in during that time really made a change to his direction in his career and also just making a change at that company itself since they were just really thinking about an innovative future, like especially in AI. So that definitely was the most heartwarming, especially, you know, since we were able to make a difference. And just like TJ was saying, you know, the first myth that they say is they're small, but even though we may be smaller right now, we're extremely flexible and we're also just on it versus a lot of other agencies who are bigger, they're a little bloated and they're not having maybe as many people who just truly care and are really on it in terms of finding the right aligned talent. So even though we were one of the smaller agencies of that company, we ended up being their top performer because we just, we, we just, like I said, we had to be sharp and we had no room for error, but that's all we needed was a chance. And we took it and we executed on it and, and we've received nothing but praise for that company from that company. Uh, now I'd like to share or, or put this out to the group. What for the for the organizations and the leaders that are listening now that maybe haven't leaned into uh, working with uh, diverse suppliers as much as maybe other people in their space. What are some of the benefits of having a more diverse entrepreneur uh, pool to be choosing from in your mind that you've seen? Uh, and TJ, why don't you start? I think one of the first things is you have, uh, if you have a diverse uh, supplier pool, you have different perspectives. Um, you're not only representing uh, a particular group, you're, you're representing uh, um, the, the, the world because the world has changed, right? The world is um, uh, people of color. Uh, people with different backgrounds, uh, seeing how uh, things work. Uh, so I would I would say the perspectives is probably one of the one of the things that people should lean into is right is having that. I think Anna hit it on uh, head right, again. Is you know you may be small, but you agile, you flexible. Uh, you can give that personal relationship where uh, maybe a larger company cannot give that. Um, then you're able to pivot as well. So I think those are very uh, those are things that you really should be leaning into and in providing that uh, particular. If you serve in the communities and the communities is diverse, I mean you have an obligation to be diverse as well. That's kind of where I stand. Is you know. Um, why not uh, put the tax dollars into the communities that are diverse? They're coming from that community. They're working from that community. So it's all impactful to, to not only the communities, but those, um, uh, those corporations that are doing business within those communities. And I would set, suggest that those communities that are diverse, I would, I would lean on corporations that are in my, my community to say, hey, what are you doing in the world of workforce diversity? What are you doing in the world of supply chain diversity? Who is doing business in our community that looks like me? Um, those are some of the questions that I would, would push back on uh, from a community standpoint. Uh, this is Anna. I would definitely um, just agree with TJ there um, in terms of working with supplier or sorry, the diverse suppliers. It's really just that change in perspective. So coming from my perspective, my background is not not as traditional. You know, I, I was a computer science major. And as a black woman, I would walk into lecture halls 
of 100, maybe 200 students. And I would see maybe one other person that looked like me and, and just no other black women. So you really understand like walking. I've always been used to walking into spaces where I'm the only one. And so that definitely provides perspective. So for some of these companies, and although we don't specialize in diversity, you know, in ter- but it's just been super natural in providing a diverse candidate pipeline, because in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking about, you know, will I be the only one when I walk into this room? So it just adds that needed perspective and also just that resilience, you know, so you're just strengthened by those battle scars of all of that adversity. So like I said, from all of the times that I've, you know, had to break down those barriers, it's made me stronger and it's, it's made me, I don't want to say hardened in a way, but it's just made me, like I said, battle ready and sharp where I have to really know that craft. So having all of those different perspectives, you know, and perspectives outside of my view, you know, LGBTQ, age, Mm -hmm. um, all different backgrounds, socioeconomic backgrounds, like that's super important because I came from a private school and I was a financial aid kid, but you know, that private school, their tuition is like 40,000. So interacting with people that were from lower socioeconomic all the way to the top 1%. So having all of those different perspectives, especially perspectives outside of my view, really just provides a value add because every company is always talking about how they understand their users. But if they're if their users or if their teams aren't reflecting who their users look like or, you know, what their users' backgrounds are, then how are they ever going to be able to accommodate and and help the the users' lives in any way? Yeah, and this is TJ. And and I like to just add on, even though we are here talking about women of color, diverse supplier just comes in all types of uh, ways here at Republic Services, we do the five major groups, right? So people with disabilities, uh, LGBTQ plus that Anna talked about, of course, minority owned, our veterans owned, uh, and then of, of, of course, women uh, business as well. So all that diversity uh, within a, uh, uh, a company can can contribute to a larger diverse supply chain. And I think one other thing is sometimes even though you want to lean in through those particular procedures and the programs, sometimes you just have to be intentional. And what I mean by intentional is is that you got to focus on, hey, let's bring in some business. I have that de- I have that opportunity. I have that decision making. Uh, l- let's let's do this. That's being intentional. <laughs> Now, uh, is there any advice or um, any thoughts on what it takes for the community to inspire and encourage maybe the next generation of uh, diverse entrepreneurs? This is Anna. I would definitely say my number one word for that is exposure. Exposure makes such a huge difference. So, for example, um, I studied Chinese for eight years. Um, so four years in high school and four years in college. And I was actually able to study abroad in China and really getting that exposure just really changed my life and, and just changed my perspective, you know, because I'm, I'm always trying to look at different perspectives that are outside my, my views. So, It's just, you know, really when you expose people and it doesn't have to be just like STEM or just any new topic that can really change their life. Like my life was also changed in high school where my counselor or one of the science teachers, since they knew I enjoyed math, they recommended that I join the or I join a robotic summer camp for Girl Scouts. And that changed my life because I have never really heard about coding or computer science at all. And I learned robot C and I learned how to code a robot autonomously. And that was, that blew my mind. And all that took was one counselor to just expose me. And so I always say to um, just expose. And I actually had a beautiful full circle moment where, so I, I played tennis when I was eight and I attend, I um, was a part of this program in South Central that helped my, ex- basically expose minority kids to uh, tennis, which is like the sport of kings and queens. 
and is a really elegant sport. And I was able to come back and just teach them about STEM or and just teach them about what I was doing. And although they had no idea what I was talking about, about UX research managers and data scientists and machine learning, but at least they heard it and at least they were exposed to it. And you never know whichever kid that maybe allowed them to Google it and can lead them to a new path. So exposure is so important in order to um, get people the opportunities that not only that they need, but that they're passionate about and not only grow, you know, different organizations or have them create their own companies. Yeah, this is TJ. And, and I'm going to echo on the word exposure as well. Um, and, and and I may not know Mandarin like uh, <laughs> like Anna, do, but I, I do um, I know a little Japanese. So uh, being in the Air Force was exposed to a lot of different countries, a lot of different people, um, which uh, in hand exposed my my two children who are engineers aerospace industrial engineers so just knowing um uh the exposure around that and and, and making sure that folks are are giving back that is kind of the the most important thing because uh, i can remember doing taking a whole um uh, junior middle school uh, through a science program, uh, did STEM, did robotics. Uh, my son did robotics as well. But exposure is so important. Um, those kids never knew about rockets on how to build a rocket, what is propulsion and things of that nature. Those kids didn't know what materials can actually cl- clean a, a copper penny. Um, so it's really about trying to understand the exposure and give those folks exposure that may not be able to go outside of their community to see any other thing uh, that that's happening. And that's why it's so important that corporations do do those particular things in the charitable giving um, a space as well as as volunteering uh, uh, those um, your, your skill set into those uh, those communities did com- mentoring as well. So, you know, going to that Nesby Junior Nesby uh, meetings and, and things of that nature provides that opportunity that that exposure uh, for those. And then uh, hopefully those exposure uh, provides that ot- entrepreneur spirit where we have more Anna's uh, in, in the world as well. Well, oh, t- thank you, TJ. <laughs> yeah. Well, TJ, um, what do you need more of? How could we help you? Oh, I, 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 I need to make sure uh, how you can help me is make sure that uh, when we have those diverse suppliers, they really know about the, the industry that they're, 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 they're committing to. Right. Uh, so you, you're talking about uh, waste industry, waste and uh, the environment is going to be here <laughs> to we're not here. Uh, so how do we go about uh, moving that that waste? Uh, how do we go go about doing uh, doing the organics? How do we go about doing um, plastic circularity where we're recycling those particular types of plastic uh, so they don't end up in, in the landfill, so they don't end up uh, uh, creating um the 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 impacts of our our environment so we really want to make sure um that uh, we uh we really learn about those industries i'm one of those industries that people really don't think about right they just put their cart on the edge of the the street and some truck come and and pick it up but it is a process behind picking up that truck putting it in transfer station transporting that to a landfill packing it composing uh not only composing but understanding that you know decomposing give off methane how do you collect that methane making sure that the environmental waste is not um, our tables are not contaminated so using these different synthetics or to cover it under and and underlined our our landfills so that is where we want to start putting people uh in because really environmental waste industry was really uh, dominant by male and dominant by uh um, caucasian so we really want to put um some diversity within th- this space in all specs of environmental waste so so tj if somebody wants to learn more about republic or connect with you what is the best way to do that 
Uh, you just go to our website, uh, uh, republicservices.com, supplier diversity, and there will be uh, a contact uh, that you can send as well. And Anna, uh, what do you need more of? How can we help you? Oh, this is Anna. Uh, I would say, well, same thing, exposure. So, you know, just like touching different audiences, whether that's hiring managers or whether that is engineering product and design candidates. I do say we specialize from senior level to C-suite talent. But if you are entry level, you know, feel free to contact me because I definitely understand what it feels like to be entry level and trying to get that first job. You know, I had to create my own first job, but I can definitely try to just help in any way I can and provide any resources. So just any exposure at all to to any audience would be amazing. And then the website, best way to contact you? Yes. So my website is www.techiestaffing.com. So techie, T-E-C-H-I-E, staffing, S-T-A-F-F-I-N-G dot com. And you can contact me at my email. My email, it's Anna, A-N-N-A, at techiestaffing.com. Good stuff. Well, uh, Pamela, what a show, right? It's been great. You know, I want to thank both of our guests for providing both valuable and just some great vibrant conversations on this topic and sharing the their the journeys and experiences that they've had to their success. So thank you both. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thank you. Glad to be here as well. All right. This is Lee Cantor for Dr. Pamela Williamson. We will see you all next time on Women in Motion.